Penny Pong Darren, Frank the Tank, Marcy, Kazumi Rose. Kazumi Rose, who had isopods make lots of babies after eating carrots. Awesome. Emily Wilson's here. Marimba Girl. Green Jedi Monkey. Awesome. Well, the first thing we're going to do here is unbox some isopod food sent to me by Incog Inverts. You can see it there on the label there, Incog Inverts, all the way from Canada. So check out this isopod food here. Incog Inverts is on Instagram, that same spelling, I-N-C-O-G-I-N-V-E-R-T-S. That's how Incog Inverts contacted me. Oh, what do we got here? Ooh, look at that. The pill diet. Interesting. Cool. Got several different containers of it here. I don't know how many exactly. The pill diet. I kind of like that. That's, that's fun. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Oh, I think there's a sticker down at the bottom. Oh, I don't mind some reusable shopping bags either. Packed in reusable shopping bags. That's pretty cool. Incog inverts. Sweet deal. Awesome. So I see. Let me set that down there. We've got four of them to try out. Sweet. Thank you for sending that. I can see you're in the stream. Dave Incog Inverts right there. Um, all right, I see also Young Lad here, Zero Kill Ninja, Sanosuke Sagara, Marimba Girl, Joseph Tavir, Ojisu, Evan McLean, Woodsy, Woodsy Baby, is that it? And Chris's Critter. Sweet deal. Lots of people in the, in the chat today. So thank you again for sending this. I'm going to try that out. Maybe what I'll do is put some... Let's try this. I'm going to drop some in my ice pod enclosure right here, right now. Why not? Looks like I have to uh, take the... It popped off inside the lid. <laughs> That's okay. Set that in there. I'll figure this out. Um, easy enough to deal with. Just use a paintbrush to get that out. And there we go. I'll try the shaky lid into my little 3D printed isopod feeder here. There's a little bit of stuff left over in there. Let's put a bit in there because I'm guessing it won't take long for them to find this and go after it and then we can watch them eat it a little later in the stream perhaps. That would be fun I think. So let's see if we can do that. All right. So thank you again for sending that. I see Vance just left a super chat for two dollars. Thank you. Love it. We've got some other people telling us to hit the like button which I also appreciate. That's fantastic. Um, See Therapod Hunters here, and Snake Lover, Yotaro. Oh, I'm so sorry, Yotaro. My, I had a, an absolutely massive headache all day yesterday. It was horrible, and uh, so I, I feel your pain. So, next thing we're going to open is this from Shapes in Nature. I'm super excited about this as well. We will be showing some live critters in the stream, no worries. But uh, I'm super excited for Shapes in Nature stickers. If you haven't checked out Shapes in Nature, he has some super cool stuff. This is Jesse. He's also with uh, Sky Island Adventures and Bugs in Cyberspace. And I lost my water bottle. It was so sad. Oh, that's cool. 50 year anniversary. Sweet deal. I didn't realize it was the 50 year anniversary. 
Oh, some of his cards. This is sweet. Check it out. Oh, I love those dart frogs. And it has information about them on the back. Isn't that cool? Ha! Huh. California condor. That is awesome. Love those. See, I, I purchased some, but he also sent me some. He added some in there. Because um, I, I was saying, I lost my water bottle, which had a lot of Shapes in Nature sticker on it. I was so sad. Every time I looked at my new water bottle, it was bare, and I was so sad. I was like, I lost my Shapes in Nature sticker. I don't care about my water bottle. I care about the, care about the stickers. <laughs> and so I ordered some from Jesse, and he actually added some. This is one of the ones I ordered, Gaboon Viper. I love this. One of the coolest looking venomous snakes. One of the coolest looking snakes, really. So that's going on my water bottle for sure. Probably all of these are. Oh, this is a surprise one. Cool. I do love red squirrels, so. Nicely chosen, Jesse. Thank you so much. I've interviewed Jesse for the channel several times. And uh, I've also, of course, had adventures with him down in Arizona a couple times. In 21 and 23. I love the, the leafy sea dragon. This is the, the sparkly version. Love it. This is one of my wife's favorite fish and of course one of mine too. And I used to keep and breed these sugar gliders. It's been many years now but I used to, we had a, a female named Reepicheep. For those Narnia fans out there you'll know where that's from. And she had two litters of babies, I believe it was. And uh, when we moved to Hawaii, we had to rehome all of our sugar gliders because they are highly illegal there for a good reason in Hawaii. So uh, we don't keep them anymore, but they were wonderful little friends. I would take mine to work. I would take Reepa Jeep to work and she would ride in my pouch or ride in my pocket or just in my shirt. And uh, People wondered what that lump was, and it started moving, and it would freak them out, and then I would introduce everybody to my sugar glider reaper cheap. <laughs> so once again, Marimba Girl, these are from shapesinnature.com. Here's the... I'm not even done yet, but here's the website there, shapesinnature.com. I don't even know which ones to show you first. I just, I just love them. It has such cool art. Oh, that's going to be awesome on my water bottle. Love that. Okay, and I'm going to show you these next um, four are creatures I either have kept or keeping right now. I don't know which one to start with. I think, uh, okay, here's one. Blue Death Fainting Beetle. Don't you love that? It really captures what a Blue Death Fainting Beetle looks like. I, I just, I love it. Here's an interesting thing about uh, dairy cows uh, in Skaber. There is a morph called um, Tunisian Pied that looks a lot more like a dairy cow than the Dalmatian in Skaber does. Um, but I don't know if they have it in the U.S. yet. It's in Europe and possibly in Tunisia where it was uh, isolated, I guess, or discovered. I don't know about that. But Oh, we've got a super chat from Emily. Do you have any Hoffman's Egg Eye for sale? I'm afraid I can't ship Hoffman's Egg Eye out of state. I don't have that on my permits, which is so sad. See, I should be showcasing these stickers better. I'm covering too much of them up with too many other stickers. So you can only see a few of them. Uh, that's a little bit better right there. And so there's Blue Death Fainting Beetle. Here is an Amblypigid, Tailless Whip Scorpion, or Taylor Swift Scorpion, if you prefer. Love those. Of course, I keep those. Um, let's see. Here is Mastigoproctus Tohono, the, the, uh, Vinegaroon. And finally, a Pseudoscorpion. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? My water bottle is going to be so beautiful, it's going to be the coolest water bottle in the world. 
So thank you, Jesse. I don't know if you'll see the stream, but thank you so much for sending these. Um, and just for YouTube purposes, I did, I did make a purchase. Jesse threw in some, some additional stickers, but I did make a purchase here, and bought a lot of these stickers. And I am super excited. I, I'm honored to do so to be able to uh, help support Shapes in Nature. And by the way, Shapes in Nature actually supports conservation with a large percentage of the profits or the proceeds. I guess it would be they. They don't keep them, they, they donate them directly to converse, conservation causes to help out animals in nature. So very fitting, very appropriate, and a good way to, it's a win-win because you're helping with conservation. You're also uh, getting some super awesome stickers, and it's not just stickers, it's shirts. I have a couple of Jesse's shirts. My wife has one too. Super cool. So there you go. But super awesome. Now let's look at some living creatures. Thank you so much, Jesse. Can't wait to put these on my water bottle at work. I have a water bottle at home that has some of your stickers on it still, but the one at work was the one that did totally disappeared and some of my favorite stickers were on it. So, very happy about this. Thank you, thank you. The cards are awesome as well. And congrats on your fifth anniversary, Shapes in Nature. Very cool. That means I must have found out about Shapes in Nature fairly early. Because I feel like I've known about it for Quite a while. Oh, I see some of the isopods starting to gather around the food there. These are uh, the Porcellionides prunosis orange cream. A little bit overexposed. Don't know if I can fix that. In a live stream, it's easier to do when I'm just using the camera. There you go. We'll come back to that because I want to show you some other creatures. Um, I want to start here. They changed the interface and it throws me off every time. Okay, let's see if I can get a guess on these. Guess what species we're looking at here? Any guesses? Rick McChesney, glad to know that I helped bring you into the isopod hobby. That's awesome. Hmm, Ruben Dali, you have isopod mansion. It could be good for some aquatic bugs as long as they're not big enough to get through the, the ventilation holes, which are fairly large. Some notonectids might be, uh, might be okay. I don't know. Oh, Ruben, you got it. These are painted lady butterfly caterpillars. They're a caterpillar that can be raised without a host plant. Uh, this is a mostly soy-based formula here, and you can see there's several caterpillars. I got two of these. Uh, this is. There's another one. You can see a couple of the, the caterpillars in there. I don't know how many exactly are in there, but. There are a few. I think there are at least three in there and at least four in here. I'm going to be raising these up this year. I've never done that. So the care for these is amazing. Painted lady butterflies are really widespread and so they're widely available. You can ship them to most states and uh, they legally ship to most states. They're extremely easy because they live on this soy based stuff. It's minimally ventilated, but it is ventilated. And the basic idea is you leave them in here. You don't even have to open it. You don't have to water them. You don't have to add additional food or anything. And when they're ready, they climb up to the top, attach to the coffee filtery paper up at the top, and uh, pupate. And you let them harden up for a day or two. Then you take out the paper. You pin it to the inside of a mesh, mesh enclosure. And then they hatch. And you've got butterflies, which is pretty awesome. So this is my first attempt, not at raising Lepidopterans, but at raising Painted Lady Butterflies specifically. So super excited about that. We'll get that going. Um, and I'm going to try to catch up on the chat. I'm going to be moving things for a second. This is going to be weird and complicated, probably. Moving the camera. Um, whew. so weird. I want to show you this. Can you see it? Can you see what's going on in there? Sorry about the wiggling while this happens. I'm going to try to make it work. But I can't guarantee it's not going to wiggle some. In fact, I can guarantee it's going to wiggle. But we'll get it working. Is 
This is a new enclosure. It's my, I think it's 2.5 gallon aquatic bug tank. Um, this is specifically for my small back swimmers from Bugs in Cyberspace. So Chris's Critters, congrats on your first duckies. That's awesome. I think I'm going to try to raise a monarch this year too. Uh, there is a company, a local company that has monarchs from the western uh, western side of the United States, west of the Rocky Mountains, and they have monarchs that are approved for release. They come with a, a milkweed plant that you can plant in your yard and allow the monarch to grow up outside and then to fly away and go help uh, improve monarch populations, minimally perhaps, but the, the key is you're planting that milkweed and it's going to be coming back um, in the future and helping to improve uh, conditions for monarchs, hopefully, and increasing the population. So, and I also planted a ton of native milkweeds. Hopefully they, they actually grow. I planted the seeds um, after, you know, I did the thing where you have to cool the seeds and everything. So hopefully they'll be going. They're native milkweeds here, showy milkweeds. So I'm going to hope to get a lot of them going. Um, so let's see. Penny Pong is ask, asking about um, Hydrophilus and Thermonectus, but I don't know in relation to what. I do have um, Thermonectus, Marmoratus, and I think a couple other Thermonectus, and I also have one Hydrophilus beetle too. So these are small back swimmers, yep, from their neonectids. I'm notonectids, sorry, not neonectids, notonectids. I'm going to be feeding them right now. Uh, they like they like uh, Drosophila melanogaster fruit flies, the wingless type. They also like Daphnia a lot. Adding some Daphnia. Those are the two foods that I have seen them really go after. Watch them as they snap these up. It's pretty neat. Sometimes it's almost hard to see, but you see them do that little flip, and then they, they have some in their, their little legs. They have the two legs they use for swimming, and then the other legs they use for, for grasping and manipulating food. It's pretty cool. When they do those little flip grab things, they're 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 getting some, getting some Daphnia, and they will clear out the Daphnia that I just put in there. I probably put in I don't know a hundred Daphnia of various sizes, and stuff. In 24 hours, they'll be gone. They will have eaten them all. And you can tell when one has one because it has this little bump. And I, I can't zoom in a whole lot more. Maybe a little without losing some quality, but you can see some of them have a little bump. Um, above them, which is under under their heads where their, their other legs are, but it's a little hard to see that. But you can see some of them have that little that little lump there because they've got a Daphnia there, which is kind of fun. Um, okay, so Romingo, what do you know about African Armored Cricket? Do you think one could keep them in captivity? I know very little about the African Armored Cricket. Um, so I, I don't know if we can keep them in activity. That's, I don't think they're over here. Um, but that's pretty cool that they exist. I mean, you know, I'm looking it up right now. African Armored Cricket, I want to see a picture of that because that sounds awesome. Whoa, that is cool. They look a little like the Mormon crickets we get around here. Acanthopolis discoidalis, subfamily of the katydids. Wow, that's pretty cool. You should look that one up if you haven't yet, folks. <laughs> Let's see. So Alex B is asking if these have had any babies yet. They have not, to my knowledge, had any babies, but I had them in sort of a a test tank just to make sure I could get them to survive for well since since bugs in cyberspace sent them to me because the first few um, iterations of trying to keep this species I put them in my large aquatic bug tank and discovered that they did not do well in there and I wasn't sure if they were being predated or whatever they weren't they weren't thriving there and so I decided okay I'm gonna set up something simple and separate to control for variables and see how they do and so I just put them in a critter keeper 
with a um, window screen underlayment so they couldn't get out and tossed a couple of ram's horn snails in there and then just fed them Daphne and fruit flies, did occasional water changes and they did fine. And they've been thriving for a while now. I had a few losses, but not many. And the majority of them are doing very, very well. And so I figured just this weekend, I put them in this enclosure to uh, try to breed them. So now they have, as you can probably see in the shot a little bit at least, they've got a lot of big pebbles or bigger than pebbles, a lot of stones down at the bottom. They've got a live Anubius plant with lots of roots. They've got this fake Bellisneri plant. They've got a cork haul out at the top. And uh, I'm just feeding them heavily. Hopefully I'll get some babies. That's, that's the hope. Oh, marimba gold, that's cool. We saw some beetle looking things in one of the oasis streams. That's awesome. Harvestman colony, um, not doing terribly well. Been declining. Trying to figure out what to do there. I think I need to move it to a smaller enclosure um, so I can regulate food more often, uh, more, more effectively. Uh, I think that would help. So would isopods, shiro, utsuri specifically be alright with a live succulent plant in the aquarium? I think it depends on a lot of factors there. Um, but I think somebody said it, shiro, utsuri might be a, not the best option just because they like it a little more moist. But I guess if you had a big enough place and you had a good moisture gradient with lots of moist areas, it might be okay. An onion painter. Ooh, getting some millipedes. That's awesome. I would say... Most of my millipede content is fairly outdated. There, there's better information out there. At the time, it wasn't bad for what was out there, but um, a lot of strides have been made in isopod and millipede substrate. And so I would definitely look into some of the more recent videos on that. Because things like flake soil and so on are much more available than they once were, and they are much uh, more nutritious for millipedes than the uh, mixes that used to be the, the go-tos. So what's my opinion on open versus closed terrariums with isopods? Open versus closed terrariums. I would say I would generally tend toward open just because I feel like closed ones are a little bit harder to regulate. Uh, that would be my opinion, but I, I'm sure there are people who succeed with the closed ones, but that would just be how I would approach it. So, Pinapong Darren, what would you say is the maximum temperature tolerance of pure nautis, specifically witches brew? Good question. Once again, that probably depends on humidity, airflow, lots of other things. Um, typically, I, I think I try to avoid subjecting most isopods to temperatures if there's not a temperature gradient. That uh, I try to avoid getting well, higher than 78 personally. I don't say that that's their upper limit. I just... I try to avoid going above that in my isopod room. That's about as cool I can get it during the daytime in the summer in my isopod room is about 78. I, I'm sure that Witch's Brew could go a little higher than that and be okay, but that's just the experience I've had, so I can't really comment too much past that. Hopefully that makes sense. Oh, Frank the Tank, congrats on saving the little morning gecko. Yeah, those... Those uh, parents will be, the mothers of the morning geckos are quite cannibalistic, I've seen it too. Hmm, Ruben, congrats on the Reductioniscus tuberculatus. I haven't kept that species, but it's cool when you can find the big ones, huh? Ooh, I can see my, uh, I just fed a few of my garters and I can see one of my youngest ones. I think she is my youngest one. She's out basking right now. She's pretty. She's an Eastern low expression flame. Aqua Garden Zen, hello. For morning geckos, their favorite food is babies. So this is super fun. I love this. I could watch this forever, but I don't know how everybody's feeling about 
watching um, these small back swimmers for longer. Maybe we'll come back to them. I don't know. I am going to... What did I just do? I don't even know. Okay. I'm, I'm switching around. I want you to catch a glimpse of my little snake here. Well, snakes. There are two of them in here. Here we go. That is my eastern flame. She's a low expression flame, so there's not a lot of red yet. That may change as they grow. Sometimes they, they'll molt, well, shed their skin and all of a sudden they're, they got a ton of red on them. That sometimes happens. Sometimes it's more gradual. Sometimes they don't get a whole lot. And this, this one has a ton of red on her. This one is my red-sided holdback. The Montana red-sided, not the California red-sided. So this is Parietalis as opposed to Infernalis. Same species, different subspecies from the California red-sided garter. She's, she's coming out pretty red. And this is an Eastern. This is Sertalis Sertalis. Again, same species, different subspecies. Um, but really pretty, even though she doesn't have a ton of color yet. We'll see how that ends up. But she's going to be a potential mate for my melanistics because the melanistics are also Sertalis Sertalis, so same subspecies. So I could um, have them mate with her, and then the babies would be hats for melanistic. Since I do not have any female melanistics, that's going to be one of the ways that I'm going to get babies from them. I am getting baby garters this year. Um, my female red side is, is extraordinarily gravid. I think she's hiding right now. It could be any day, honestly. And she looks huge, maybe bigger than she ever has been. So I'm really hoping that we're going to get lots of baby red sideds this year. Um, last year we had 29, and one of them was stillborn. It looked fully formed. It just didn't get out of the sack properly. And so it died by the time I found it, it had, had died. Um, the year before that, we had 28 without any stillborns, I think. And the year before that, I think we had 21 with one stillborn, if I'm right. So she, she tends to have decent sized litters and they've been going up. So we'll probably have a lot. And because uh, I think she made it earlier this year, it could be seriously any day. She's, uh, her scale spread is intense. She looks huge and uh, she has been, she's had a very low food drive lately, which is a sign that she could get birth soon. She's just about to shed. She's in blue right now, so it could be any time. Therapod hunter, a freshwater jellyfish in the UK? That is so cool. Hydra viridissima. So is it basically a hydra that uh, keeps the medusa stage? And, and that's its primary stage or one of its primary life stages? That's, that's pretty neat. Yeah, this one... This one almost reminds me of uh, a checkered, but it's not a checkered, but it almost reminds me of one the way this pattern looks. And this is, this has a flame, flames come from uh, Montreal, Canada, I believe, the locality. So I don't know if she's pure flame or just has flame blood in her or what. I should ask. But... Uh, yeah, look at, look at the red on this lady. Now this one right here just ate two pinkies. She's a small garter. Um, she just ate two pinkies. She's young still. Um, she's a little over a year old. But it took her kind of a while to eat dependably, and now she's eating just fine, so she's going to start growing now that she's big enough to take pinkies. That's how happens a lot of times with the garters when they're little. Once you get them eating whole pinkies, they just take a spurt, so I think she's she's at that point. She just had two pinkies as well, but she's a little bigger. She's still not very big. She's probably like 14 to 16 inches. She's probably just over 12 inches. Um, but 
Ruby is nearly four feet long. So she can fit a lot of babies in her. I wish she were out and about so you could see her because she looks uh, incredible. She's so huge. So I don't have the California garters. I have the California red sided. I just have the uh, Montana red sided, which are these. So they do have a ton of red on them, some of them. Some have far less red than this. Um, so Marcy, first time snake owners. Um, garters are not a bad option, actually, and I've helped people start out with snakes with garters quite a few times. They can be a great option. Uh, corn snakes are great, too. I've never kept ball pythons myself, but they're supposed to be a, a decent beginner snake. There are plenty of other colubrids like uh, king snakes that can be great. Uh, rat snakes, things like that. But corn snakes are one of the top picks because they are very easy. They tend to be very easy to feed. I think they're a little easier to care for than a ball python. They're a little more active in general. That's that's what I hear. I've, like, I've never... I've worked with all pythons like at the zoo, but I've never kept one individually. Oh, I love the smooth green snakes and the rough green snakes. We actually have green snakes in my state, but I've never seen them in the wild. Let's see. Somebody poking their head out to the left? Uh, not in this enclosure. This is a different enclosure. This is my baby enclosure. It's just a really simple enclosure uh, for my babies. You notice I have this tape down. It's for my grow outs, I should say. Not my babies. When they're first hatched, are born. I don't put them in here. Um, but this is my grow out for these little ladies. And I just have some, you know, I've got leaf litter. It's got ice pods and stuff. And it's got enrichment. I just put this in here the other day for them to experiment with climbing in the tube. I just put this slab of cork bark leaned up against this um, spider wood. Give them something interesting to do to try to, you know, keep them doing their thing. Oh yeah, I would I would agree smooth green snakes aren't beginner snakes and they're not really good pet snakes like handling sort of snakes. They can be good display snakes, but not uh, not so much for handling. They tend to be high strung. They're they're insectivorous, so they'd make a great display snake in like a large bioactive arboreal vivarium. Um, but corn snakes can be very docile. The babies aren't necessarily so much. But as they get older, they can become very, very docile. So the tape is here because there's a gap right here. And garter snakes can slip through, well, snakes in general can slip through very small holes. And that gap is a lot wider than I would like. So for now, this is what I have here. I'm going to come up with something more aesthetically pleasing, but this is temporary. But it's, it's effective. So I do keep lots and lots of wood lice, lots of ice pods, many, many, many types. This, oh, she is just beautiful every time I look at those colors. So is she. It's hard to find an ugly snake, right? Am I right or am I right? Okay, now we're going to look at the aquatic, large aquatic bug tank while I'm here. Let's try it, shall we? I'm nearby, and my hydrophilus beetle is swimming around. He's huge. He, she, I don't know, male or female. It's got to be at least two inches long. It's probably bigger. So I think that would be fun to see. Here's some... This is the Thermonectus marmoratus, the sunburst diving beetle. I also think behind that ramshorn snail shell, I see a very tiny beetle back there. And there's my Hydrophilus, the large giant water scavenger beetle. It's been very active lately, which is cool. Um, there are so many in here. I'm going to see if I can drop some food in. And we can watch them eat because they have a very strong feeding response. Super fun to watch the beetle tank eat. And I have some cichlid pellets right here. I'll drop right down in the front and as they fall down we'll be able to watch them eat them. 
So how many isopod species do I have? I'm not sure right now. Um, I have had uh, more than 85 types, but not all of those are species. Some of those are just morphs and varieties and localities and things like that. So um, probably well over 50 species, though, as far as I know, at my peak. I am consolidating and reducing somewhat, trying to focus more on species that I can ship. So, um, I, yeah, I have reduced somewhat for various reasons, and that's one of them. So the duckweed, I'm not actually much of a fan of duckweed, but it got in here. The, the nice thing is, oh, there's one of the banded, banded diving beetles right there. If you're familiar with the character Charlie Brown, this one reminds me of that shirt, Charlie Brown shirt. They're fun. Um, let's see. Oh, I bet that beetle's going to find the food. Should we watch for it? Um, I can show you some uh, Porcelia wood lice on camera in just a minute, yeah. It's complicated moving around kind of in this room, but I, I think I can make that work. Hmm. Sorry, Yotaro, about your head. I hope you feel better. <laughs> Ramingo, you love all bugs, but the aquatic ones are evil. And Sean, yep, I've got various Anubias in here. I don't know what that one is, but it is an Anubias of some kind. Mostly Anubias, uh, Nana Petite, I think, and then here's a Cryptocurine uh, Wintai, I think it is. And then I have the dwarf water lettuce up at the top and some duckweed. But the this uh, water scavenger beetle eats the duckweed and the dwarf water lettuce, which is nice because it helps reduce what I have to deal with. I think it's going for this fish food now. Let's see if we can grab one. Yeah, pretty pretty confident that that's what it's trying to do. I've never seen it try to take fish food from the surface. It usually goes down to the bottom and gets it when it's sinking. Interesting. Oh, there that one of the sunburst diving beetles has a pellet. There's a couple that have grabbed pellets. They're zipping around the tank now. There's one with the pellet of food. So I do have a ferocious diving beetle, Coral Works. I mean, diving beetle. Diving a ferocious um, water bug. That's what I meant to say. Sorry. Not a diving beetle at all. It's a true bug, not a beetle. Um, I have a ferocious water bug. I do not have the Lethoceris, the giant water bug anymore. They don't live all that long. Mine passed away in the fall. Um, but I'm hoping to get another one at some point. Yeah, if you're not expecting a giant water bug, they can be pretty pretty intense, pretty surprising. I got bitten by one when I was a kid. It was not fun hurt quite a bit. All right. Are we ready for isopods? I'm actually surprised we're not getting a little bit more activity in here. I see beetles in various places, but let's see. Okay. The only problem, I'm going to try to show some, some isopods now. But it's gonna be it's gonna be messy for a second. It's just there's no way around that. Okay. So I have to hook up some, some things. Ooh, look at that. That's that's not gonna stay there, is it? Probably not. Eh, we'll try it. This is the food from Incog Inverts right there. I just put in there a little while ago. So these are not Porcelio, but they are isopods. These are Porcelionides perinosis orange cream. And I, well, that's what we're seeing first because that's what was already here and that they were eating this food and we were talking about looking at that uh, earlier in the stream. And 
That's much better than looking at the uh, the table surface. I think you would all agree while I'm getting this set up. So the largest land ice pod, that's a good question. Um, I don't think the largest land ice pod is in the hobby, but as far as length goes, the biggest one in the hobby would probably be um, Porcelio Hoffmanzegai, the nominate form. And then we have uh, Porcelio Expansus is probably the widest in the hobby. And then as far as conglobating isopods, the one that can roll up, Hilaria brevicornis might be the largest in the hobby. There are probably others out there for both of those that top those. And then if you account semi-aquatic isopods, there are some bigger ones. Some of the Legia species are bigger. Okay, I am now getting some isopods. put these, uh, these orange cream away. I love orange cream. They're probably my favorite Porcelione days. I think so. I think they, they must be. They're, they're amazing. Here's a Porcelio, fairly large Porcelio species for you. This is uh, my favorite Ornatus. So let's take a look. Oh, Goblin Slayer, that's Tyler. Awesome. It's fun when uh, folks who purchase something show up in the stream. I love that. So welcome, Tyler. And I, I just shipped to you, didn't I? Invertebrate person spent $20 on an ice pod shirt. Awesome. Where did you get your ice pod shirt? Oh, yes. A pine. There are semi-aquatic ice pods. Uh, many of them, of the ones I'm aware of anyway, many of the ones I'm aware of live uh, like in estuaries and, and near the sea and stuff. When I was in uh, Miami Beach, Florida, I saw some. The GA Zotica, I think they were. So these isopods right here, this is Porcelia ornatus, which is brew. It's not a naturally occurring form. It is descended from a naturally occurring form that has a high yellow it, uh, markings that were intensified by selective breeding, but then a mutation showed up, which is very similar to the mutation in Magic Potion, the Dalmatian mutation. And so the selective breeding for the increased yellow, the natural propensity to yellow, and the fact that this Dalmatian mutation takes away a lot of the dark color produces this particular form, the Witch's Brew. So male from female for isopods, there's a lot of different things going on there. Some species are really easy to tell because the uh, exopoda uropods, which are those two structures that stick out the back there, in the males in some species are much more, they're longer and more pronounced than in the females, and in others that's not really the case. It's not so much the case with ornatus. It might be a little bit, but it's not as extreme as it is in some like Porcelli expansis or Porcelli Hoffman's egg eye, the nominant form have very, very pronounced uh, uropods in the males. Um, so that method is not terribly dependable. But if you turn them over, which is easier said than done, there are some structures in the males in the pleopods you can see where they're uh, modified into kind of a downward pointing, pointing toward the back copulatory organ. In the females, they're just kind of flat. And you can see, um, you can see that difference. I did make a video about that. And I think it's in my breeding video, Ice Pods, and I took some pictures using Hoffman's Egg Eye, so it's really easy to see the difference. So that's that's the easiest way to do it, I think, is to, to tell from those uh, structures underneath them. So, can I see stars in the sky from where I live? Yeah, yeah, I can. They're not super easy to see all the time, but I can see them. We actually have some dark sky parks not far away from where I live. 
so I can get to Dark Sky Parks fairly easily. And just getting out of the desert up into the mountains, I can see them pretty, really pretty well. I love the way that they look on the, the wood, even more than on the, uh, the egg cartons, the way they stand out. It's pretty nice. So what ice pods do you recommend for beginners? Um, I think some of the easier armadillidium, like armadillidium vulgare, armadillidium maculatum, armadillidium gestroi are good for beginners. Uh, Porcelia lavis, Porcelia scaber, Porcelionides prunosus are great for beginners. I would say those are all good options. And it doesn't stop there. Those are some of the ones that occur to me. There's a baby one. This one's quite a bit smaller than the adults. They, they had a couple of clutters of babies quite recently, and I'm just kind of checking around to see what I see. Ton of springtails under this one. I don't see any baby isopods under that one, though. What about over here? Oh, yeah, there's a little one. A couple of little, little ones. See that one right in the middle of the screen? There's a couple of them, really small. Which is brew. And there's a there's a somewhat bigger one in the cavity. There's another one in that other cavity of the cork. So they're around, little babies. Marcelo spinicornis, did I answer that? I don't remember. I don't have spinicornis currently. So to pick up smaller isopods, do I have one of my scoops here? I like to use a combination of a uh, small paintbrush, which I should have around here somewhere. I like to use a small paintbrush, like this one, and a scoop, like this one. You can use, you can get softer bodied isopods into one of these pretty easily. It's much less dangerous for the isopods. The combination of those two implements. Which isopods are we looking at now? You can check on the uh, T-positive albino armadillidium vulgare. Here's a good one for beginners right here. The color color form doesn't really matter as far as armadillidium vulgare. Um, there we go. You can see a few of them crawling about. I love the colors on these too. I just changed the substrate in there. Um, I think. Is this one of the ones I just recently changed the substrate in? I think it was. Let me check my label. Yeah, I changed the label recently. Changed the substrate. So a lot of them are probably burrowing, which they do. I don't see a ton of them. Let's see. Um, sorry, I'm grabbing some more isopods here in a second. I'm going to look at some wild type Montenegro here. These are the Klugai Montenegro, Armadillidium Klugai. Not necessarily a super awesome beginner species, could do it. You can see how many little ones there are. Just a few adults in this enclosure though. So, Mystic Drake, why don't cultures such as gem mixes revert back to the wild type? They can. I think a lot of times it depends on what you start with and the proportions you have. If you, if you put in a lot of different genes at the beginning, it can take longer for them to revert, and they may not necessarily revert. Let's see, there's probably some more under here, too. Yep, here's some more. This culture is sort of bouncing back from a bit of a slump, so there's lots of babies that are older. Not a lot of adults, though. I think I recently changed the uh, substrate in here, and they're, they're growing fast now. Sometimes a uh, substrate refresh is the best way to do things. Get things cooking again. Mm. Let's take a look at this setup, these are my yellow zebras. I just recently set this one up. Um, I did a video about it, in fact. Here's the food that I just got from Incog Inverts. Um, there it is. I'm going to feed some creatures here. Feed some yellow zebras, why not? Where is the food dish? There it is. Food dish in this case is just a little scallop shell. 
I do like to use food dishes to keep the food from directly contacting the substrate because I don't think that typically can cause problems such as mold. It depends on how much you feed, how dry the substrate is, how many isopods are in the enclosure, and all kinds of things like that. But I just like to use uh, a little feeding dish to help make it easier on myself. Let's see if we can dig these up. Once again, here's some nice yellow zebras. Yeah, I do recommend trying again, Chris. Um, I would say that Montenegro are not necessarily easiest, but as long as you make sure they have a pronounced moisture gradient and tend not to miss the enclosure directly, just dampen the, the moist side directly, like pour water on the moist side, they tend to do better. That has been my experience. And then plenty of dry side. So, do I own any expanses at the moment? I no longer have expanses colonies. It saddens me, but I don't. I do not. Uh, let's see, someone asked me about my favorite Cubaris, right? I'm going to go out on a little limb here. One of my favorite Cubaris at the moment, at least, is this one. This is Cubaris murina anemone. And they're not expensive. They're easy to keep. I love their orange and their variable orange. You can see some of them are orange with darker markings, some of them are darker orange, some of them are lighter orange. They are just fantastic. I love them. They might be my favorite and they're not expensive, but uh, I don't care. They're really cool. There's some more. You can see some of these are quite dark orange and some have some really interesting markings on them. And some are almost wild type and some are very, very light orange. I love the variability. So the ones I was showing just now, uh, the, the clue guy I was showing right now, those were Montenegro, but I do have Dubrovnik. Here's some Dubrovnik right here. Dubrovnik tend to have red, um, red striping alongside their segments, like the ones in this shot you can see. I noticed they don't usually have any orange, any yellow spots like the Montenegros do. Um, but these have these red stripes. So these are these are the Dubrovniks right here. They're really pretty too. I think because of the increased, <coughs> excuse me, increased red. Um, I I want to show you my favorite Montenegros right now, though. I mean, favorite clue guys right now. And this may change, but I'm really enjoying, uh, really enjoying these. These I believe are descended from Montenegro, but it's a morph. It's a morph of Montenegro, as far as I'm aware. Um, these do not exist in the wild. And these are extremely, they're doing extremely well for me. This colony really took off. This is on the uh, BioLive substrate from BioLive's Bioactives. And the isopods are from Isotopia. And this colony is just thriving. And they're gorgeous. You can see these have the yellow spotting. Many of them do, which is why I believe part of the reason why I believe that these are um, probably descended from Montenegro. I've also seen the naming conventions seem to support that they are from Montenegro. Uh, I really love the wild types, but something about these really just, I, I enjoy them a lot. They're fun. And the, the ones that I showed you, the Dubrovniks, those are, I'm not sure if that red, the red striping is something that shows up in the wild. I kind of have the impression that it is, but it may have been selectively bred for. There is a, a version out there called Red Phase where it's just red with the white spots. They look like little strawberries, kind of, which is cool. Um, so I like those a lot, but I don't have them. I have some, mine have a little bit more red than normal, maybe, but it's hard to say. 
But these are seriously just gorgeous and they're just thriving. So Frank to Tank, I haven't really thought about selectively breeding the ones with the brightest yellows, but I probably could do that, huh? You see that one is very pale, the one that's right in the center right now. And it looks like it may have molted part of its body, but I think it's naturally more pale. And some of these are naturally more rich in color. Some of them have brighter yellows. I see what you're saying. Might be worth a shot. That could be really cool. Because some of them, some of these are like highlighter yellow. And especially the ones on the darker orange, it's kind of showing up. Yeah, some, I guess you could say even reddish on some of these. And this this entire enclosure is just just full of them. This is this is what I like to see, but it also means I probably need to upgrade soon because they're just everywhere. Every piece of cork bark, every bit of substrate, they're just everywhere. So I only upgraded them to this enclosure. When was that? December. I put them in this enclosure in December. Um, upgraded them. But look, all these different pieces of cork bark. I'm just picking them up and they're everywhere. And I do think... Uh, it has to do with partially the quality substrate I put them on. That that makes a difference. And these I can ship, and I do ship. They're not on my website yet, but anybody who uh, messages me, as long as I still have enough of them, I do have enough to sell a few now. So if you are interested, Emily, let me know. We could make that happen. I, I do have a permit to ship these to your state and to most states, not Hawaii. Uh, there may be a few other states I don't have, but I have a permit to ship those to almost every state. I wanted to take a look and see um, how my Werner I are doing. I re re uh, did like half or more of their substrate recently, something like that. I just want to see how they're doing. So let's flip this piece of wood. See how they're looking. They're looking okay. They're doing all right. Look at those. More Porcelio. Hmm. Porcelio Werneri, the Greek shield isopods. One of my favorite Porcelio. Just the stark contrast between their their gray bodies and then the white uh, skirts. And it's a really white skirt. Some ice buds have skirts. These have like intense white skirts. So they're they're very cool. And they are very dorsally flattened as well. Probably an adaptation to something in their habitat. It may be a way to uh, reduce moisture loss in their habitat. It may be um, the kinds of um, hides they are available. They may have to really be flat to take advantage of the hides that are available in their environment. I'm not sure. But they are definitely dorsally flattened more so than many isopods. Winter eye are very similar to Porcelia marginatus. I feel like Flavo marginatus, I mean. Flavo marginatus climb, they walk much higher up on their legs and they're not quite as flattened, but they do look quite similar. Uh, so, and also Flavo marginatus tend to have white markings in the center of their um, dorsum as well and these don't always there are some there's a version of them called silverback i think that look a lot like a lot of times the babies will have a sort of silverback pattern and lose it so you can see how some of these have sort of a pale area in the center and most of the adults don't have it uh, porcelio flava marginatus have a very pronounced white uh, markings there they're they're quite attractive And the Werneri, I cannot sell out of state, unfortunately. Klugai, I'm good on. I can sell the Klugai, any type of Klugai, out of the state. I cannot sell Werneri out of the state. Wish I could, because they're amazing. <laughs> I never thought of that. Up in. These do not conglobate. They are incapable of conglobation. The entire Porcelio genus doesn't conglobate. They're... There are various genera out there like Armadillo, Armadillidium, Venezilo, Cubaris, um, Nezodilo, Filipino Dillo. There are so many gen genera that conglobate, but uh, Porcelio is not one of them. 
Succinctus are cool too. They look like a cross between Expansus and Flavo Marginatus, in my opinion. It is about that that uh, time. It's been about an hour. Um, I appreciate everybody chiming in. I appreciate the super chats as well. Um, I hope you enjoyed the very varied stream today. Did a lot of different things, but I, I'm glad that you uh, were here, and I hope to see you next week. Have a good one, everybody.